everyone, Rob Orgel with Spartan Armor Systems. Today we're going to be taking a look at the ballistic dummies and engaging them with 9mm and 5.56. We're also going to treat them immediately after, giving us the opportunity to look at the different types of med kits from Spartan Armor. First, let me introduce you to Mike Pena. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Pena. I'm a 22 year critical care paramedic with seven tours overseas and a lot of time in the city. Let's make sense of each acronym we're going to use. First, let's understand MARCH. So what MARCH is, is this is a quick algorithm that we can use to find out what's the most important priorities in treating a patient. So we have massive bleeding, airways, respiration, circulation, and hypothermia head. Head, as in head wounds. As in head wounds. Next, we've got MIST, the mechanism of injury, and that's what caused this person to get hurt. Then the injury sustained. For example, today we're gonna to be shooting them, so guns and bullets are gonna cause the mechanism of injuries. Exactly. Injury sustained is what happened to that dummy. Then we're gonna look at signs and symptoms. How much blood, what's, what is this person going through in this moment, and then what our treatment is. And so we've got the MIST, and that's more of a reporting procedure as we're giving this information to someone else. Lastly, we mentioned it earlier, and we say it a lot, is TCCC. What's that mean? So TCCC, or TC3 in some areas, is known as Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And what this is, is the committee that does a lot of research. They're the ones who decide what is approved for these combat measures. So let's start with the Stop the Bleed kit. Tell me what that looks like. So the Stop the Bleed kit is designed to stop any major bleeding that anybody would incur. So this is basically the sister version of CPR. This will be next to any major bleeding that you're gonna have to face. All right, so next let's take a look at the EDC. And what I like about the EDC kit is it's tiny. It looks like it's designed to fit in a cargo pocket. Right, at the everyday carry, what we want with this is, if you're not gonna be running out there with backpacks and everything, you need something that's small and concealable. So we wanna make sure we have this on it and it's gonna have everything you need to put in for a tourniquet, immediate, stop the bleeding, and anything to take care of yourself in that situation. This way you have everything you need, but it's convenient and not everybody knows what you're carrying. Now, on the other side of that spectrum, a much larger kit that's gonna hang off the belt. I mean, obviously this is Velcro and Molly, so this, is, this isn't something you tuck away. No. This is the first response kit? The first response kit is designed to be on your pack, or on your Molly, or on your belt. So what this has is two different types of tourniquets in there, depending on what kind of patients you have. You'll have anything to fit March algorithm. So your massive bleeding, your airway, your respirations, circulation and hypothermia. So also, this, you could probably take care of more than one person with that. This care. is made to take care of more than one person or awesome. multiple injuries. Cool. Uh, and then finally, the AFAC. And this is just the much more advanced version for the individual, correct? It is. So this is for the individual. And unlike the first response kit, this can only usually handle one patient. It has very similar types of equipment in here, but it's usually just made for yourself. And as you can tell, it's slightly bulkier. So now that we understand what the intent of each kit is, it's probably valuable to make the kit your own, right? Right. We want to make sure that we prep our kit. So as your kit comes in, things are still going to be plastic. So you want to make sure that you're taking out all of your tourniquets and prepping it the way you would use it in a real life situation. Because it's valuable that it doesn't need to be clean. It needs to be rapidly accessible. You need to get to it fast. It's more important that way. Absolutely, because nothing in the field is sterile anyways. Exactly. And then when you can pull some stuff out and you can add whatever you need to because it's your kit now. It's your kit. Make it your own. What we're giving you now is all the stuff that you need to handle that March algorithm that we train in TCCC. So again, if there's something that you need from a different kit, you can put it in your own, but this has all of the basics. Absolutely. Bonus up on extra tourniquets, put some extra tape in there, whatever gear you might need for specific to your mission or whoever you might be working with. Exactly. And if you're not sure exactly what you need, you could go onto the website and it has all the information of what's in each kit and then you can tailor it to what you need. Perfect. Well, let's shoot some dummies. Sounds good to me. A benefit of today is we brought in Dr. Short to give us a hand in understanding what's going to happen on advanced medical care with these casualties. Thanks, Rob. I'm a board-certified physician in critical care medicine, which means I take care of patients in the ICU, including surgical patients from trauma, such as penetrating trauma from what we're going to see today. When patients come in, they are often at the extremes of their physiology. They're in shock, they're in multiple organ failure, and we're going to touch on some of the mechanisms that we can do to try to enhance their survival and give them the best shot before getting to a trauma center for definitive management. So from the gunshot wound to the in the field treatment of, of Mike helping us out to stabilize all the way to making it to you and how you're gonna get this guy back on his feet. Yeah, that's correct. And there's just simply a limitation of what can be done effectively and safely in the field. But that field medicine is critical in the chain of survival for trauma patients. Excellent, thank you for being with us today.
So here you can see we hit him in the top left of his shoulder, and that's a dangerous area. He'd probably be bleeding a whole bunch. That's correct. He's hit one of the major vessels, likely subclavian vein, subclavian artery, which runs right below the clavicle bone. It's going to be a major source of bleeding right now, and he has probably seconds to minutes until he enters a state called hemorrhagic shock. Unless he gets treatment. That's correct. Mike's given him some serious treatment. He started with direct pressure because he's seen massive bleeding. And with that direct pressure, now he's moving into a pressure dressing, and he's going to start packing it to get that bleeding to stop. So we get time to move him to higher echelon care. Correct. He needs hemostasis right now, which means he needs to stop the bleeding because without definitive treatment, this is a wound in a place that is not easily compressible. It's not where one can put a tourniquet on. So immediate packing of the wound to try to achieve hemostasis is his best chance for survival. So if you don't have the kit, you don't have the training, you're pretty much going to die. That's correct. Unless you're really good at improvising, your odds are very much stacked against you. What do you think he's feeling right now as he's getting packed full of gauze? So he is in likely a lot of shock. Uh, he's in pain. He is probably still processing what exactly is going on. Uh, his ability to further care for himself uh, as his own person would be very, very limited without the appropriate equipment and appropriate personnel with him. So now he's treating the backside. And this is where self-aid, it's just not going to happen. Packing your own wound. Correct. So you're in a buddy aid. It's, it's your ability to help your buddy or your buddy's ability who hopefully has the equipment and the training to help you. And now, now he's pretty well stabilized. We've got to get him to the hospital. But once he's stabilized, he's going to keep pressure for three minutes. And then he can wrap it. Once he wraps it, he could be back in the fight. Theoretically, yes. Uh, he would need definitive care, of course. Uh, he's going to need two surgeons. He's going to need thoracic surgery and vascular surgery in order to definitively correct what's going on. Uh, but for right now, he is being temporized with the equipment. So how much time do you think Mike just bought this person? I think realistically, probably half an hour easy of half extra hour. time uh, before he would need definitive care. Which is plenty of time to get to a hospital now. Correct. So correct. likelihood of survival, much higher. Exactly. So here this guy took contact into patient's left lung. You can see he's oozing quite a bit. Mike sees the uneven rise and fall of his chest and goes straight to the occlusive dressing. What's this guy feeling right now? He is in overt respiratory distress. This guy cannot breathe well right now. He is going to be seconds to minutes away from the pneumothorax, which is where air enters the cavity between the lung and the chest wall. That can be a devastating injury, which then leads to circulatory collapse, cardiac arrest, this guy has seconds to minutes to live with an injury of a penetrating trauma to the chest as he took. And every time he's rising and falling in that chest, it's pulling air in and crushing that lung, Correct. Right? He is entrapping air and that pressure differential is what's causing his left lung to collapse. And in fact, his entire organs are gonna be shifted over leading to circulatory collapse of his body if he does not get immediate aid. So here it looks like he's got an occlusive dressing on the front. He goes right to the back looking for that exit wound because if you let one of those sides bleed, it's going to continue to collapse that lung. Right. right. And our colleague uh, astutely cleared away some of the blood so that way we get a good airtight seal. With these types of temporary measures, as included in his kit, we can get a bit of temporization so that more air is not entering the chest and we can stop the pathologic process there. And because it's the chest and it's the lungs, there's not a lot of blood coming out. And that's normal, right? That's correct. This allows you to do your occlusive dressings and to be able to get a definitive airtight seal. And it comes back to our acronym, the massive bleeding, which didn't happen. So the next priority is the airway and he's establishing and, and making sure that he can continue to breathe. Absolutely, because if we let this go on for seconds to minutes, he may be too far gone at that point. And now that we have that done, instead of seconds to minutes, how long does he have to get to the hospital? We have quite a bit more time. We have uh, hopefully enough time to be able to get to a trauma center where the definitive management would be a chest tube, which is a tube which would go into the chest wall, applying negative suction force to be able to relieve that obstructing air and also to reinflate that lung. And something really nifty is each one of these kits comes with two of these dressings. Yes, and that's very important for your entry and exit wound as demonstrated. And then this specific type of bandage, this, this occlusive dress, is this one of the better ones? It is, certainly. So there's been an evolution of these types of field dressings. This is great because not only is it very compact, but it's also very practical. It allows air to go out, but not inward. Now, as a fighter, though, this guy is on the ground, not helping. Completely. He is in no way able to continue on his He's fight. sucking for air. Yes. Absolutely. But because of the kit, because of the treatment he got, the training and equipment kept this guy alive to get to higher echelon care. Absolutely. All right, so here he took it right about the base of his jugular, and that was a federal HST. So what's he seeing right now? 
So right now he has extensive blood loss. You are probably having both arterial and venous bleeding from the carotid artery as well as the internal jugular vein. And with that, you are having a big outflow of blood. This is going to be very tough to bandage just due to the sheer volume of blood occurring. And it needs fast management for hemostasis. And that is best addressed with an immediate pressure dressing as our colleague is putting on right now. Tourniquet would be ideal, but you're not getting a tourniquet here, so you're just pressure dressing the best you can as fast as you can, right? That's correct. And the other things you need to watch out for, if you have a large development of blood in this area, such as the neck, you can have airway compromise due to the swelling of the bleeding on your airway, specifically the trachea. In addition, with hollow points or other uh, types of bullets, you could have some fragmentation where this could have also caused an injury to the lung and lead to a pneumothorax as well. So after our colleague addresses the immediate problem of bleeding, we'll need to do another survey to look for his breathing status as well. Which comes right back to our acronym, massive bleeding, which is what he's treating. And as soon as that's under control, if it gets under control, let's hope, then he'll move into that airway and make sure there's not a ton of damage to the lungs. And here you can see he's kind of wrapping up the massive bleeding and he, his hands would be covered in blood, wouldn't they? Absolutely. And this is also challenging for the inexperienced operator because it's going to continue to look like he's bleeding. And as he is demonstrating, you keep holding pressure on for many minutes without peaking because otherwise you're not going to be able to obtain a blood clot. So now with that massive amount of blood loss, should he pass out, the next priority for Pena might be that NPA. Correct, so the order of operations is always gonna be secure your airway first. We start to get significant derangement in a patient's physiology at about 25% of their total blood loss. That's where they start to get signs like fast heart rate, dropping of blood pressure, et cetera. At 50% of their blood loss, we enter a shock state, and that is where the body is not getting enough blood and oxygen to support the vital organs and tissues. As such, especially the brain is gonna compromise from that. You can get decreased level of consciousness and you can lose your airway as a result of that, which could be devastating in the field. So as this guy goes unconscious, slips unconscious, Pena's now got that airway established through his nose with one of the NPAs that comes with our Spartan Armor kit. Yes, he's using a nasal pharyngeal airway. What that does is it provides a channel for the back of the throat to be able to remain open and patent for air to pass. Now, this is not a definitive airway. You would need to be getting to a hospital, having him intubated and put on a mechanical ventilator. But as a temporizing measure for the person in the field, this can be a great solution to temporize things. And speaking of temporary, with that massive blood loss, he could be getting really cold. Yes, with the blood loss and with the shock state, he's gonna be getting hypothermic where his tissues are not gonna be perfusing well. He needs to conserve body heat. And in fact, in the trauma base, we have them artificially elevated to 85 degrees for that very reason, because patients need to be kept warm when they're experiencing high volumes of blood loss. So the solar blanket that you find in your Spartan Armor kit is not for comfort, it's actually for treatment. It's completely for treatment. So after you have your bandages in place, you have an airway in place, this is going to be another step to be able to allow this patient not to go into for a full circulatory collapse. So here we pulled out a lot of equipment from our Spartan Armor kit to keep this guy alive. First, we got the, the packing with the gauze. After we got it packed and stabilized, an NPA to establish the airway. And then finally, to treat for shock, we got him wrapped up to stay warm. That's correct. And with that kit, we should be able to buy him some time until he can get to a trauma center. Because of his kit and his expeditious movements, this guy's going to get to hospital and survive in what percentile rate? It depends on the mechanism of injury, of course, but I would say he would be dead in any of the scenarios that we have covered. He now has a chance, probably 30 to 50% of survival. Excellent. In this video, we got a unique opportunity to see what different types of 9mm bullets can do to a ballistic dummy. And with the advanced background in medical field work, as well as the very deep background of understanding what happens in that hospital for the advanced treatment, we got a good idea of what it takes to stabilize our patient, get him to higher echelon care, and understand the statistics in his likelihood of survival. In the end, having the right equipment is just a piece of the equation. You also must obtain the right training so you can be cool, calm, and collected when you need to preserve someone's life or your own. To check out these Spartan Armor kits, check us out at SpartanArmorSystems.com. So the Spartan Armor defeated everything we shot at it, and that really wasn't very fun to watch. So let's be honest, we know what you want to see.
Patch up, bring the brain over. There's still an eye socket. Get out your MPA. Fantastic. Give this guy some Advil. <laughs>